All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome to another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. This is Tessa. I'm so honored and excited to have Acharya Shunya back on the show for round two. Um, And uh, I'm just (laughs) so excited because I got such good feedback on our first chat, Shunya, that I mean, it's no surprise that people wanted to have you back. So Welcome to the show. How is it going? And um, yeah, how are you today? Thank you for having me back. I also have fond memories of our conversation. It felt uh, spontaneous and real. Yeah. And uh, while I'm on many podcasts and many radio shows, yours stood out. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Wow. That is the biggest compliment. That is such a huge thank you. That's such a huge accomplishment. So I will make sure in our show notes that we link to to our first conversation in case folks missed that. And also by way of brief introduction, um, if you're new to Shunya's work, she's the author of a few books now, but the most recent one is Roar Like a Goddess, which we talk about in, in detail on the first podcast. And so we're like a goddess subtitle, every woman's guide to becoming unapologetically powerful, prosperous, and peaceful. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book that um, takes us through some of the archetypes of goddesses. And it's such a fun way to, to dive into these, to these archetypes and really apply it to a modern day life. Um, and Shunya, you're also the first female head of a 2000 year old Indian spiritual lineage. Um, and so it's such an honor. It really is such an honor to have you here. And so I'd love to start with, um, you know, how has it been going? What's this book's been out for a while now. It was on sale back in September. Yeah. My life has changed because of this book. Awesome. And um, the book has done really well. I mean, um, to call it a bestseller is fine, and which it is, but more importantly, it's making an impact. Mm-hmm. And I'm receiving stories from different parts of the world, wherever English language is spoken or read, this book is selling. And I'm happy to say it's making a difference. The people, the women and people of non-binary fluid genders, and in fact, even uh, men, anywhere anyone has been systematically disempowered, they are benefiting from this book. It's gratifying, Tessa. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. What do you think that, what would you attribute to? I mean, certainly I have my opinions about that, but I'd like to hear from you what you think the success is attributed to. I think there is a mystical element here. I think talking about the goddesses from India who were empowered, who led bold lives and who who overcame, who 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 show us how to find the power from within, that's important. Mm-hmm. That's important. And I think because those goddesses and their stories don't just apply to Hindus, but they're universal, they're symbolic. And it is said that hearing those stories or reading those stories um, changes our DNA, like works on us deep down. So I've had people who've, like I got this one letter from a woman who's an atheist and she began reading the book to mock it and to make fun of her friend who was reading it. And then she loved it and she wrote to me. So, Uh, it's not religious, but there is something universal and there is something about talking about a collective story through a different prism. So if you're a Western woman and if you see your story reflected in an Asian prism and how that ancient archetype dealt with it, you're like, this problem's been around. And it's and and it's being dealt with. And I don't have to feel so alone and singular in this terror or situation of disempowerment. I can speak up. I can take a different action. So there's been some fun, fun, fun momentum around this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, as a result of that, are you inspired to do things differently these days? How does that have your daily life looking? I think I was already roaring like a goddess before I wrote the book. So I've not had a huge change, but I have to say that I've become quieter Mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of what I had to say, the, the, the fierceness and the passion was, uh, has now been released into the world. Mm -hmm. And there is a place of living with power in a quiet place. I think I'm doing that more and more. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Does that feel peaceful? Very. Does that feel... Very. Yeah. Yeah. That's in fact, in this book, I talk about the goddess Saraswati and how she's a archetype of peace, but the peace that she represents is not through bypassing our problems or pretending like they don't exist or just burying them under the rug. Mm -hmm. Saraswati, this goddess of peace, and in her mythology, she also has interpersonal issues with her spouse, as many, many, many women do with their partners. And she dealt with it squarely. She called a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And she decided how bothered she wanted to become. And she didn't really want to be too bothered with it. But she definitely knew that her life, her goals were a priority. And that brought peace to her. So her peace came from not avoiding, but looking at the situation, not necessarily confronting in that particular situation, but withdrawing, disengaging emotionally. But she gives us different options because Durga confronts Lakshmi kind of what? Is a, Durga is a goddess who confronts every single time. Lakshmi is a goddess who values herself enough to let it all dissolve. And Saraswati is somebody who becomes indifferent, not in a cruel way, but an emotionally sovereign way. Mm. So I like that kind of peace. It's a peace that is well earned. It's not a peace that women and people of non-binary genders have been told to hold up a placard of being peaceful as in not being dangerous to the planet. (laughs) We promise to follow the rules and as a result, we're going to be peaceful (laughs) for you. Yeah, no, that's a good distinction to make. Well, I have two follow-up questions on this topic. Um, The first one is you mentioned bypassing. And um, I feel like this is a buzzword it's been a buzzword. It's been in in our vernacular for a while now, but I it, it comes up often enough, especially in this realm of podcasting, that I'd like to get your take on it, and that is spiritual bypassing. Um, and in your words, what do you think that is, and how do we know if we're spiritually bypassing or not? There, there are two meanings for me as a as a Vedic teacher as a lineage holder for this word. When I used bypassing earlier, I meant it from a perspective of uh, of being delusory and around happiness and positivity and always looking for the best in the other and giving uh, the law of karma or dharma and other spiritual teachings a spin to justify your cowardice or your non-action or your rescuing codependent behavior. Mm. For example, sometimes people say, um, I have an abusive partner or a non-respectful boss, but this might be my karma to deal with it and come to some greater learning. And it's like, no, you can say no to that humiliation right now. Your karma is to stand up to it. Your karma is not to be um, devoured by that. So bypassing can be a a justification for your non-action, for your passivity, for your ignorance, for your self-sabotage using spiritual concepts. Mm -hmm. And probably that, that fits right in for those of us who are spiritual and disempowered that we might be doing some of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I've done it. Um, you know, you may have done it. We've all done it. We do it unconsciously. It's not because we're evil. It's, it's just so easy to use some spiritual concepts like kindness to all and emanate love and light. <laughs> but um, there is something called discernment in our spiritual journey that we forget to employ that really should we should we sh should we be sharing our love and light or uh, should we be withdrawing and that is what the goddess saraswati talks about the other kind of bypassing i wanted to talk about at a, at uh, at a as a teacher of a <clears throat> non-dual vedic tradition is the new age teaching of some of the hindu philosophies and teachings and uh, in this, we are minimizing, diluting the knowledge and using one extract or one concept to give ourselves a, a whole permission to do something versus, versus really going deeper and understanding the depth of something. So when we are bypassing we are we are in effect uh, cutting the spiritual journey down by several years and having a momentous leap into a delusory state, such as I went into meditation for three days and I've woken up awakened. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and during that time, we would have suppressed or minimized our our ongoing emotional conflicts, we would have buried uh, self doubt and somehow done something within our psyche to emerge bright and radiant with only the healed parts of ourselves showing and the shadow suppressed somewhere. So we're using spirituality to promote ourselves, advance ourselves and uh, polish and perfect and present a persona, which is sadly only a persona and not our authentic self. Mm. Yeah, so that's why I'm glad if you're hearing a lot about bypassing because uh, on an everyday level and, and, and then in our greater spiritual journey, I'm seeing that happen. I have students who borrow bits and bytes of my knowledge suddenly they put up a website and they declare themselves as a spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they've kind of bypassed the spiritual journey and the depths of study as well as desolation and detachment that's required to go through it. Yeah. You're bringing up so many, oh, there's so many themes that I want to pull on in here. And so I'm, I'm vigorously taking notes so that I don't forget to ask you yeah. about these themes. Um, one of them that you mentioned is the non-dual um, teachings that you ascribe to, if I heard you correctly. And please correct me if I'm wrong, because I am still studying this. I'm learning new things every day and I'm doing my best to teach it based on the way that the information is presented to me. But my understanding of non, non-dualism in this school of thought it is like a very ancient philosophical yogic approach to these teachings in terms of there not being any separateness in terms of, um, seer versus self and, uh, that the the dualism school of thought did we start to see that come into um more of a philosophical practice during the the classical teachings of yoga in within patanjali's yoga sutras yeah well actually in india if you ask me are uh, three systems of um, seeing the universe or seeing existence are coexisting there is a non-dual mm -hmm. which says that albeit we see differences but that's only until we wake up from the dream of the separation mm -hmm. but really we are radically one because we share one self one consciousness has morphed itself into the many the living and the non-living and it's that one truth and even gods and goddesses are really none but your own true self 
And and it's the basis of all my writing. Even in Roar Like a Goddess, we realize that the goddesses are not above us in the clouds, in the Hindu heaven, but really her own self. So that's the non-dual vision. Then there is the duality vision, which says, well, there is a greater consciousness and there is a, a version of that consciousness that dwells within us, which is a minor version. And the two shall never meet though we are we can consider ourselves as children or servants of that greater consciousness and this is where all religions thrive they like to keep a separation from the god from divine feminine divine masculine and the divine servant or the divine seeker divine devotee in fact in some at least in hinduism the the devotee is also divine whereas in the many religions you know the devotee is a sinner or the devotee is um, um, still working their way up, so to say. Yeah. But there is a duality, duality. But that duality, the Vedas or the Vedic, the oldest philosophy of India, which is the Vedic philosophy, recognizes because it says, "Look, in our everyday life, there is a duality. There is you. There is me. There is the listeners, and it's it's where we begin." But where we can aspire to is when we go beyond the differences to understand first that we are really one and then later to experience that oneness is the next level. Mm -hmm. So the, the non-dual vision of philosophy does not exclude duality, but it just says duality is not the permanent truth. It is the apparent or the current truth that somebody may be experiencing. But there is a third um, stage in between, which is known as qualified duality, which is very special, which says that, uh, which is a Vedic vision, and which says that you know that there is duality and you know that non duality is where we are ascribing to. But this qualified duality is yes, I'm separate, but I'm not really separate in my essence just like sparks of fire emanate from the same fire drops of water belong to the same ocean when they are in the ocean they're ocean when they're separate they're a drop of water mm -hmm. a wave rises and has its individuality but then collapses back into the ocean in the same way duality is 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 made inclusive through its inherent an inseparable relationship with the whole. Mm -hmm. And all these three point of views existed. So there is yoga that is taught from a non-dual perspective, such as by, uh, by a rishi called, or a sage called Shankaracharya. There is yoga taught through a duality perspective or a qualified duality, you can say, which is Patanjali, mm -hmm. because he says that each one of us is separate, but we have Purusha or soul inside us, which is part of that, that greater consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it was not necessarily from a historical perspective that by the time Patanjali came around in second century that we had more duality. You can say that, um, it made sense for him to choose that perspective because it's easier for a lay seeker to begin with duality. I have a separate mind. It's full of confusions and clashes, suffering. It's, it's teeming with vrittis or waves, thought waves. And I'm going to calm it, calm it, calm it, calm it, and, and watch it, watch it, watch it till I reach that still observer within me which is the Purusha. Mm -hmm. When we go to Shankaracharya, who is non-duality, he realizes, well, um, you know, um, Tessa's Purusha and Shunya's Purusha, it feels like they have separate Purushas. Mm -hmm. But Anjali left it at that, your Purusha, my Purusha. Mm -hmm. But Shankaracharya says, well, they're really, it's only one Purusha. Mm -hmm dwelling in each one of us. And so that Purusha was called Virat Purusha. Virat means the ultimate one Purusha. Uh, and we're back into the non-dual framework. And we want to go into the practicing learning framework, we can jump into Patanjali's framework. 
And back in India, the seekers, the yogis and students were exposed to these different schools of thought. And one was not lesser than the other. It was an understanding of it. Like if you are, if you're with an elephant, somebody's looking at the trunk, somebody's looking at the legs and saying an elephant is a very leggy creature. <laughs> Somebody's saying it's a very flexible creature, those who are holding the trunk. And there were some who were looking at the whole, which is a non-dual perspective. From a learning perspective, from an individual work perspective, Patanjali's model works better mm -hmm. because there you're taking charge of your own, own personal life, yamas and niyamas, the dharmas. Uh, you are uh, you are responsible for your own short term of purity, your own nonviolence or ahimsa. You know these teachings for an individual aspirant, mm -hmm. and then you are taking charge of your own mind and its vrittis. How many thought waves per minute is happening? And it really only wants to take you up to the purusha, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that Patanjali was not understanding because he came from the same worldview of the Vedas that once a person connects with their own Purusha, it's a matter of time that they will realize that everyone's Purusha is the same, but then that they leave to the next level of journey. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't give too complex uh, an explanation. I could talk about yoga philosophy all day and I love I think it's a complex subject subject matter, especially when we're talking about multiple schools of thoughts and, and different approaches to it. So I appreciate I, I appreciate a detailed answer. Um, thank you. And so you you mentioned something about a student taking some of your teachers and throwing up on a website and then um, claiming kind of like an, an enlightenment, and that has me kind of taking that in a different direction on this topic because I'm going through a yoga I'm teaching a yoga teacher training right now but having gone through several myself I know this is a topic that's going to come up within our group and that is this idea of imposter syndrome when we're taking these teachings that are ancient um and have withstood the test of time I mean here we are what some 5000 years later still utilizing these practices and these teachings and how do we how do we <laughs> conceptualize these teachings honor the teachings of yoga honor the traditions of yoga um and then and go and spread that message as teachers with other students you know so i guess the the question is <laughs> well, what are your thoughts on this idea of imposter syndrome when should we start teaching these teachings ourselves that we've practiced and learned um, in a way that is honoring of the tradition of yoga? One, thank you for asking. And two, uh, the answers are pretty straightforward. And I hope that your students listen to this podcast to acknowledge the strength of their teacher, you, and what answers I'm going to give. One is that there is no need to feel like an imposter because you're not from India. Because the Vedas were very clear, and I'm not saying it to please any group of people. The Vedas were not written for one kind of people who look like them, pray like them, or mate like them. Okay, the Vedas were very advanced and yoga and Ayurveda belong to the Vedas. That's why I'm saying the word Veda. Mm -hmm. um, today we look at yoga separately, Ayurveda separately, Tantra separately, Jyotish separate are really one mm -hmm. and that was the vedic wisdom and the vedic wisdom's core belief is why they were why they were even present existing was sarve bhavantu sukhina all beings be happy it didn't say may indians be happy indians who live this latitude and this longitude be happy it was like may all beings be happy mm -hmm. Sarve santu niramaya, may none suffer from sorrow. Again and again, in the Vedic chants, Vedic yogic chants, we again and again come across this word sarva, all. Sarve bhavantu sukhina, all beings be happy. Or sarve sham purnam bhavatu, all beings be whole. Sarve sham mangalam bhavatu, all 
beings be fortunate sarve sam shantir bhavatu all beings be peaceful and and sarve sham swastir bhavatu all beings be in well being and when this all being was being mentioned it was not even human being because that's an english translation what they were really saying was all sentient creatures that experience pain that can experience sorrow may they all be there so first of all the vedic yoga knowledge was for all beings india was a buzzing center of um of knowledge in the ancient days there is there is evidence historical linguistic evidence of scholars from greece mesopotamia arabia everyone traveling and carrying out knowledge so it's not um it's not a big deal if that knowledge is now being taught in the americas or in europe or in africa this is the dream of those ancient sages coming true one regarding the imposter syndrome first we should we should make sure and be authentic in the journey where we are mm -hmm. so for example we can say i have learned it from this teacher mm -hmm. or i'm still learning or i'm still sitting at the feet of my guru if they have a guru and um or or i have read this book the yoga sutras or or yoga yagnivalkya and it's like blasting through me so just speak your truth when we speak our truth the imposter syndrome virus cannot get to us there is room for everybody's contribution in fact these sciences are growing through the contributions and the experiences of people worldwide the imposter syndrome comes up when like some of my students do they remove traces of where they studied they don't like to you know they no longer want to accept that they were ever a student learning from a teacher like acharya shunya they want to show like they woke up with it mm -hmm. and that's when your greed has come in that's when your pretense to be a self realized uh, person has come in whereas in the vedic tradition every student has a teacher every teacher was once a student and always a student mm -hmm. so when we it's also less pressure on us mm -hmm. and even as the lineage head if there was something that i'm not clear about i can still say you know what let me let me go back to the text to look it up so we don't have to be know it alls and we definitely don't have to be magical know it alls mm -hmm. um there is some knowledge that i have borrowed from the western scientist i am a buff i am a neurology buff i love reading about re reading and listening to podcasts about the brain and the nervous system also partly because i am a healer and i am a vedic physician so i understand these things so sometimes when i quote knowledge from a non vedic source it's really simple all i have to do is quote the source and say i'm benefiting from this non indian but beautiful world heritage of human kind mm -hmm. uh so part of being an imposter syndrome is when we when we take our skin color our culture our country our nation too literally mm -hmm. if we start living in a world heritage it would be we would not feel so like significantly different mm -hmm. so i would not think i'm brown so i can't borrow some white medicine mm -hmm. and the white people shouldn't think they can't benefit from brown medicine or take it forward that's mm -hmm. clear that's one thing coding sources being real about your journey and being okay with not knowing because we are all participants in a greater mind we've not all read that mind we may have been introduced to specific scriptures i may be knowing more scriptures than you but that doesn't mean i know all the scriptures i still really know a drop in the ocean maybe i can maybe two three drops but that's it there is so much to know but whatever we can embody authentically 
naturally with some simplicity, I think we'll continue doing service mm. to the people who are meant to study from us. And more than what we what we what we pretend to know, if the authenticity of not knowing will be more inspirational to our students. I hope that helps, Tessa. It helps me. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So you brought up Ayurveda, and I know it's a subject that um, you have written a book about, as well as um, providing medicine to to um, people that come to you for, you know, help with that. And so, is was that your first book that you wrote? By the way, that was my first book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is, is it called Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom? That's okay. right. Okay. And the subtitle, A Complete Prescription to Optimize Your Health, Prevent Disease, and Live with Vitality and Joy. So I want to, um, you know, I think that, it, and I'm curious what your experience with this is, is it seems like Ayurveda is becoming more um, accessible and people are utilizing it as um a preventative healthcare option. Um, but I want to unpack what it means first, the word Ayurveda, um, and how do we use it in our modern day landscape? Um, and because it's so it, it, like the subject of yoga itself, so vast, there's so much there. Um, where do we start? We can start with the name itself. Ayurveda comes from the two words, if you break up Ayur and Veda. So Ayur really comes from Ayush, which means life. And Veda means knowledge. So it's not just a knowledge of disease. Mm -hmm. It's not just a knowledge of some significant factor, biological marker. It's, it's, it's the knowledge of the whole life led in such a way that one, you don't fall sick. Two, if you've fallen sick, you recover mm -hmm. all naturally mm -hmm. by igniting healing within you through realignment with natural laws of nature. And what's those natural laws of nature? The biorhythms in nature, the time the sun rises, sun sets, when it's at its peak, affects your gut, affects your mind. So we should eat, drink, exercise, have sex at specific times. They may be odd days, but generally we can follow that chronobiological rhythm. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, which can be on a daily basis, a 24 hour rhythm, um, when our earth is spinning on its own axis. And then there is a 12 month rhythm that comes from the sun, earth orbiting around the sun. So it's a seasonal rhythm. I am an expert in these rhythms, and my book is now considered a classic in these teachings. Uh, when we stop following these rhythms, something miraculous happens. Uh, people with like chronic disorders, even incurable conditions, and um, pain, chronic pain, inflammation, um, and degenerative immunological disorders are, are finding that their body seems to be um, activating a new response within them, the health response. They're getting better, their symptoms are fewer, their biological markers are changing. And uh, this is the credit to the same teachers who gave us yoga and meditation that has set the world on fire and taught us how to de-stress ourselves. The same yogis gave us Ayurveda and um, I have now a litany of students, of people worldwide who are readers of my book or they take an actual course with me through my, through my organization. They study with me for a year uh, and that's it. We have people recovering from all kinds of conditions, even uh, the, for example, the scans of the brain in a multiple sclerosis patient is radically changed for after six months of following these rhythms. And when I came to America, Tessa, I 
my grandfather was a great renowned very famous teacher of ayurveda and yoga in india and people would travel miles and miles hundreds of miles on foot or on in car or bus to reach him and find him and get a prescription from him and he would say something very astute and simple and they would make a change and they'd come back with garlands and flowers to thank him so i noticed that medicine was simple it was it was a matter of looking at what's not aligned where are you out of out of sync with those cosmic laws coming back to them and boom the body starts remorphing itself the organs start normalizing themselves ayurveda is not magic we still have some people who don't recover from organ failure etc but i've even had some people whose organ failure was reversed so <laughs> so then it gave birth in my experience when i became my grandfather and i started helping people to the awakening health model that health is waiting within each one of us and that is a core teaching of the vedic yogic tradition that your well-being your wholeness your health your light is within you just claim it that's how depressed people become non depressed with yoga and that is how unhealthy people become healthy with ayurveda mm -hmm. so then i wrote, wrote a book with nothing like nothing diluted for westerners because that's a trend let's just dilute it repackage it make it trendy i just wrote a real book and i think you might enjoy it because it's because it is co-authored by my 9 year old self and so I have childhood stories in it of adventures and whatnot. So it's kind of people love that. Yeah. And um, yeah, she wanted she she wanted to co-write it with me because um, I want you to know, Tessa, that I have a immunological genetic condition, or I'm diagnosed with one, and because of which I couldn't walk when I was a kid, and I have been on the wheelchair mm. as a teenager. And it was after that, that I completely surrendered to the Ayurveda way of life in my family. For a while there, I was like a child or a teenager. I didn't want to follow those laws. I had a head of my own. And, and you know how children push away what's in their family. Yeah. So I'd gone through that too. And so I couldn't walk when I'm like 16. And my grandfather came up to me one day when I was sobbing in bed and he said, well, you can walk, you should fly, plan on flying. And I don't know why, but I understood. Mm -hmm. Like that was a guru disciple moment. Mm -hmm. I understood that he was telling me to not, to not limit myself mm -hmm. and to not try and make happen what was not working, but create a new reality. And since then, though I had been studying Ayurveda, I really became a devotee of Ayurveda. I became a practitioner of it. And now I not only walk, I run. Every day I run. And I've never been back on the wheelchair or crutches or anything. So my miracle plus the teachings that I had became this huge book, which is like a big bestseller. It became the top 10 books in alternative medicine in the year of its release. Mm -hmm. And it's being taught in many schools as curriculum, many Ayurveda schools across America. And of course, I teach from it in my school. So, mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Well, so oftentimes I think, and this might be part of the dilution as, as it relates to something that becomes popularized or marketed in in Western culture, it seems like the doshas are very heavily, um, and it's kind of fun, right? Like to, to figure out what your dosha is. And so I'm wondering how important it is in your opinion to understand your dosha. And my, I think I understand this in the way of um, there's a particular dosha that you are born with. And then there's a particular dosha that you may have developed over a lifetime that that could be out of alignment with what yeah, Tessa, you're... it's a total lie okay one doesn't need to know one's dosha mm. one just needs to understand nature 
and one needs to understand there is a universal lifestyle taught for all human beings. Mm -hmm. And if we follow that, we don't really need to know our dosha. The dosha is an important concept, which used to be known by the doctor mm -hmm. of Ayurveda, who would, who would then assess your dosha and give you some medicine. Mm -hmm. Somebody who wrote the first books of Ayurveda came up with this fun quiz that yeah. you can take and develop typologies of the Pitta Kapha, then teach recipes based on it. So in my book, you won't get that quiz. Mm -hmm. And I teach doshas at a much deeper level, as in when you're having pain in the body, there is the air element has gone up. And as a result, you should pacify it with some fire and earth. Mm -hmm. So here is what you can do. So I use it more as a, as a scientific concept to understand foods and spices. Mm -hmm. more than get lost and trying to diagnose yourself and then justify why you're feeling a certain way. It's a, it's a, it's, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I am, I was so angry for a while um, because of how Ayurveda was dumbed down because it's my favorite go to science. It helps me be who I am, happy and healthy. And then I decided not to be angry, but do something about it. <laughs> so since then, I have written this book. I, I have a course, which uh, one year journey that I help people with, which is the book plus more. Mm -hmm. And then I have, um, you know, I go on uh, s podcasts of people I feel are going to be receptive of my, of this greater truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm doing my part now. I'm less angry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm so I, I'm curious about uh is it fair to think that there are maybe some if we're interested in the subject of Ayurveda and we just want a few things to try to start with in terms of a a blanket maybe diet, let's say. I'm thinking about um in particular, uh, animal products. What what does Ayurveda teach about consuming animal products? So Ayurveda is a medicine, not a. Uh, it it's it's a bit different from the yogic path, mm -hmm. which is more around the spiritual journey. Ayurveda wants to stabilize the body, so there are times, not all the time. It prefers a vegetarian diet. But there are times when, for example, in muscular dystrophy or when during muscle weakness or sperm count is low, one needs a diet of eggs and um, meat. And so Ayurveda would prescribe it. And sometimes people are shocked, but Ayurveda was very scientific in that perspective. And... Uh, so it is. So it, and then it goes into detailed investigation of various types of meat, pig meat, cow meat, horse meat, crocodile meat. And sometimes you wonder who's going to eat crocodile meat, but then they wrote it for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so there were populations, tribal populations in India who were eating crocodile meat. If you're in Africa, if you're a Maasai warrior and you're into Ayurveda, you will eat crocodile meat, you know? So uh, there was like um, the popular meat categories and then the lesser known, but they're all investigated. And then you're told not based on your dosha diet, but based on your metabolism. If it's, if you feel hungry more often, if you feel tired and exhausted, and if you're feeling, if you want to conceive a baby, you want to nurture your eggs, goat meat is the best for you. Example, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you feel cold a lot, if you, if your hands and feet feel like frozen, circulation is poor. Okay, let's go for chicken. So there are these, these detailed teachings, which somebody who wants to just plug in and use Ayurveda may or may not benefit from but 
at least Ayurveda has this detailed resource and research, not on mice, but on humans mm -hmm. for over 5,000 years. But if you wanted to, somebody wanted to benefit a little bit from Ayurveda, because I'm on your podcast, I'm just going to put a shameless plug in for my book. <laughs> just, just read it because it has so much. Uh, people have told me that even reading one chapter was more illuminating than five years of study of Ayurveda in the wrong model. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there are other authors too who've done a good job. So it's not like, oh, I'm the one lone person. Otherwise, my life would be very dismal if I'm all alone holding the torch. But so be careful what is your source. Um, and it's not just Indian authors who are writing great books. I mean, there are great Western authors of Ayurveda too, like David Frawley is somebody I really respect uh, who has written some wonderful books on Ayurveda. So those are some books um, that we can plug into. And there are more people coming to my mind, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to be mindful of your time, but I, so I guess I'll let this be the last kind of subject topic question. And it relates back to something we were, we were starting to discuss when we were talking about um, philosophy and um, you started to talk about discernment. Um, and this is something that I was attempting to lecture on last weekend um, with students. And I was, um, as I was researching and reviewing and preparing for this lecture on discernment, I um, had come across the, one of the sutras, um, future pain can be avoided. Mm -hmm. um, Viveka, um, I believe is that specific sutra. And so I was wondering if you could just Give me your thoughts on that, this idea that future pain can be avoided. Um, and does it relate to this ability to discern? Yeah. So discernment is a less used function of our brain. Mostly our brain-mind uh, complex is simply acting and reacting based on the stimuli. No sooner does the stimuli enter, we act and react, or we, you know, we're using our motor organs, we do something or the other, and we're done. And so we live in this reactive mode most of the time. And when we're in a reactive mode, our ignorance, when I'm talking about a cosmic ignorance, metaphysical ignorance is heightened. And we act in ways that will perhaps in future cause us suffering, pain, or cause our planet and fellow people and fellow, you know, trustees of this planet suffering. So either way, it's bad karma also that we generate. Mm -hmm. Discernment is stepping back uh, to a mode where, where there is um, a tendency to pause Discernment includes a pause, like literally a timed pause to not react right away and to take in the stimuli and then connect it with memory. Like what's the learning from memory, you know, uh, and then take in uh, knowledge from our teacher or a book, apply it there, investigate that situation and then respond. Mm -hmm. And while discernment is not possible, like if there's a fire happening and somebody says, call 911, we can't, we can't just like take, take time out. But even then we are using memory. When a fire occurs, we call 911 and that number is 911. And this is what happens. And 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 the discernment has happened in the past that don't delay. Mm -hmm. Okay. If somebody calls their mom to tell them there's a fire and doesn't call 911, then that person is lacking. We say, don't you have any discernment? Didn't you know any better? Then how do you have a practice of knowing better? How do you have a practice of, of, um, of, of being able to apply knowledge, apply memory, apply intuition to a given situation. 
And that is known as Viveka. And when we start doing that, in, in neural language, we can say that some higher centers of the brain become activated, which are present for us. So now we're not just operating from our animal brain, we are now working with a higher brain and which is known in Sanskrit, in yogic language as buddhi. And when the buddhi is awake, we have the capacity to have a more 360 degree vision of our situation. In my own day-to-day -day life, for example, I'm feeling frustrated with an employee, an example, who's working in my team. Some, and it's a frustration. That's my first limbic reaction. And if I just act from that place, then I might lose a valuable employee. I, as in anybody, will lose that valuable employee, right? But if I step into a Viveka mode, I will think and I'll wonder, like, really, is are they frustrating or have I not given them clear instructions? Mm. Um, is it a case of me not giving clear instructions or do they just have too much on their table? on their plates. A third situation would be um, maybe the time zones are not matching. They, they are up and about doing things and I join them at a later time, East Coast, West Coast. It's just, I'm just randomly shooting, you know, saying things. Like we will learn 10 more things and we'll then know what to fix rather than just be irritated and then just, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. So a yogi lives a life of discernment because when we start doing our daily discernment we can then discern all the way to do i really need to be getting drunk tonight or should i be eating a simple food and drinking hot water i'm going to bed early <laughs> like what's my sadhana do i then we can discern into is this really my mind is this my whole true self feeling so panicky or is this just my mind having a having a crazy moment and i need to reboot it with an om chant or a meditation mm -hmm. so the discernment is a practice that begins out here but it really goes all the way inwards to help us discern between purusha and prakriti between truth and appearance between what is the real self and what is the shadowy self mm -hmm. so it begins in the world, but it ends up helping us release us from the world. Because my discernment, for example, has reached a place where when difficult problems come in my life, I'm like, yeah, no, no big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just gonna grow from all this. This is amazing. A lot of things that don't serve me are gonna fall away. Wow, wow. You know, because mm -hmm. you've now discerned all the way. <laughs> Earlier, a problem came. <gasps> problem should not come. Oh, no, no, no. You know, we're always like scared, catastrophizing. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Thank you. I had the opportunity to practice that last night when I was holding a, my plate for dinner and a cup of wine, and I slipped on the steps, and it just everything went up. And then came down and shattered and mess everywhere. <laughs> My initial knee jerk reaction, I think, like most of us, was I was frustrated, but then it was I was trying to understand. This is a very simplistic way to put that, but I was trying to understand what's good about this. What can I learn from this? How can I remember in the future to learn from this particular situation? There you go. So that part of your mind that was observing, not freaking out, that was thinking uh, different ways. And it there may be nothing to learn from it, or they may be, but at least by having that higher, uh, higher inquiry into your first thoughts, you are changing the paradigm and you're keeping the windows open then for some greater thought to come in, or if nothing else, acceptance. Okay, mm -hmm. this happened. Yeah. This exactly. is what the universe wants me to do, clean up. That's exactly. It. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, actually, that's a brilliant example. And that's that's an example of somebody's Viveka button being on. 
it doesn't always have to be on when you're meditating and contemplating on a scripture. This is it. It's like on at this random time. There is another voice, another questioning that's happening. And this is going to be key uh, for, for taking us out of the samsara mess and saying, do you really belong here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, Shunya, it's such a blessing to get to do this with you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. Let's meet once a year. I'm yeah. having fun oh, talking to you. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. I look forward to it too. Yeah. Oh, that's making my heart swell. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any last thing you want to share? Any Anything that you want to make sure it gets implanted in our minds as we say goodbye? I think this was a great conversation and we touched many areas of Vedic wisdom. Veda comes from the root word vid, V-I-D, not the English vid, W-I-T-H, but V-I-D, vid. And vid means to be aware, to come in the know. Mm -hmm. And yoga, Ayurveda, these are all pathways to come in the know. And I think this podcast is also helping our listeners come in the know. So thank you for that opportunity. I'm also learning and growing with the Vedas. Thank you. Thank you, Shunya. Uh, I'll make sure. And if you want to share your website, but I'll make sure that all gets in into the show notes. Um, in sure. Your, yeah. Uh, is, is that the best way for people to connect with you again? Yeah, my website is a great place to find out about me. I have an Instagram handle by my name. That's another place where things are happening. So, yeah. Our Facebook got hacked and my the Viveka part of my mind said, oh yeah, oh wow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Everyone, that concludes another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something new, maybe remembered something old, maybe felt inspired to apply something to your life. My, <laughs> you can hear my dog in the background. She's doing a little happy dance. Um, so Daisy enjoyed it. Anyhow, I wanted to just pop in here to wrap us up to say a couple of things. Number one, I have such an amazing team that helps me put these podcasts together. Without them, I wouldn't you know, be able to bring these amazing conversations to you. So thank you to my producer, my director of creative services, my sound editor, my um, engineer, Consistency Media don't know what I would do without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the amazing creation and artistic musical genius Drew Lovern. Thank you so much for putting together this music for specifically for outside the studio. So unique to the show. Only place you're ever going to hear it is right here. Thanks you guys. You make my world go around. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, share on the socials, especially if it's a show that you think, hey, this could help somebody else. That's what this is all about, right? We're sharing information so that we're better, um, so that we're inspired, so that we're lifting each other up and we're learning how to be in this world, living on this planet to the best of our ability, sharing information and inspiring one another. And that's my hope. That's my hope for the show. Take care.